Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. South Africa and Africa are starting to realize the risk posed to the exports by the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the development and the likely response. Hi Terence. Hi oh, Chanel. What has the EU decided about the use of a carbon border adjustment mechanism? Well this uh, mechanism, also known as CBAM, has been knocking around for quite a few years. And in December last year, they decided formally that they would be introducing this uh, system. And it's really to prevent what they call carbon leakage in a context where European companies are paying um, uh, carbon prices. Uh, and therefore, imports are coming into the European Union that might come from jurisdictions that either have no carbon taxes or carbon prices or very low ones, as is, as is the case with South Africa at the moment, where we've got very low a carbon tax where there's a lot of allowances. Theoretically the system is to try and prevent uh, that from happening and to stimulate decarbonisation in those jurisdictions where uh, Europe is importing from. So that's the theory but it's also seen in a context at the moment of a sort of a scramble to support and protect uh, green, nascent green industries. So we see a lot of uh, efforts around this, not only in Europe, and therefore there's a suspicion that this is about protecting uh, their industries, and also because the revenues are going to be raised uh, in Europe rather than in the developing countries, which are the ones that are exporting these carbon-intensive products. These revenues are going to flow to support those domestic industries rather than to support decarbonisation efforts. So there's a bit of scepticism around it, but that's what has been decided and they are wanting I think later this year around October to start introducing it. What is the potential impact on South Africa and Africa? It's significant even though we don't know what the final architecture is and where there's going to be free allowances and what the carbon prices are going to be that are going to be used but South Africa and South Africa uh, European Union is still a major trading partner it's a dominant trading partner about 26% of Africa's exports uh, go to the European Union. So it's a, it's a very important uh, jurisdiction for Africa. And the work that's coming out of the London School of Economics uh, that hasn't yet been published, but it's, it's going to be published soon, is showing that it could knock about one percentage point off Africa's gross domestic product, about $16 billion a year in, in, you know, because of the effect on, on exports. So it's very significant. And then a paper that's been developed for the Presidential Climate Commission is showing in South Africa that uh, this iron and steel sector is particularly vulnerable. This is going to cover sectors such as iron and steel, uh, aluminium, fertilizers, electricity, green hydrogen and chemicals. So we, we are involved with all those. We don't export electricity from South Africa to, to the European Union. but. Um, Ironically, there could be some benefit from CBAM if we start producing green hydrogen, but we don't do that at a scale uh, at the moment. So really, it's the um, iron and steel sector in South Africa looks very vulnerable. And because indirect and embedded emissions are also included in this, the way this, this mechanism is going to work and be calculated, uh, it makes our, also our aluminium-related exports and uh, fairly vulnerable and our chemicals. So. It's, it's significant for Africa, it's a real threat for South Africa, uh, and we have to pay attention to it. What is the likely response? Well, I think that uh, South Africa traditionally will oppose these sort of unilateral trade me measures. Um, you know, we've had quite a tense relationship with the European Union over a number of years on a number of these sort of new tariff mechanisms or new protective me measures that have been coming in. But this is affecting many, many countries. And the view is that developing countries, or at least African countries, will probably band together in some form and take this to the World Trade Organization and try and seek a multilateral uh, resistance to the implementation to get, you know, as, a, as a group uh, because of the impact on all of Africa um, and South Africa being one of, the, one of the participants in that. So I think there will be legal action that will be taken in some form. You might also probably find that there might be action taken from developed countries against this. Many developed countries, other developed countries, Canada, 
Japan um, are also considering this, and the US are looking at some form of prevention of so-called carbon leakage in their trading system. So I think there's going to be uh, that sort of action, but uh, it's a risk. It, we don't know where it's all going to land, and we don't know where, you know, WTI processes take very, very long. Um, and uh, if it is implemented later this year, even if there is some sort of action and there's potential for other countries to be implementing similar things, it poses a real risk, particularly to South Africa, because of our, the carbon intensity of our exports. We know that our, especially because there's indirect emissions in there, we know our electricity system is overwhelmingly coal, more coal than any other country in the world. It's really dominant. Plus we have coal in some of our, our liquid fuels through Sassel. So we're very, very vulnerable to, to this, uh, as well as the direct emissions uh, are, are going to be high. So it's something that there will be resistance to, I've got no doubt, but we don't know what form that resistance is going to take and we don't know what role South Africa is going to play within resisting CBAM. What should South Africa's response be? I think we have to walk and chew gum. So I think if it is, as some have described, as deeply unjust, highly unilateral in, in form and a risk to our trade and also it's not clear that it's going to really stimulate decarbonisation in developing countries or, or in this case South Africa. I think we should look at a multilateral response and look for a particular alignment from the world uh, to support if you want, uh, the, the, the effort is supposed to be about decarbonisation, not about protecting new green industries. If it's really about that, let's find a way to do this. But I think it's coming. I mean, there's some form of uh, carbon border adjustment is coming and it's been coming for some years as a number of analysts and commentators have noted and we haven't really got our ducks in a row and we are very vulnerable so we, we I think on the walking side yes I think it's going to be about the WTO and finding some sort of resolution or maybe even a bilateral uh, approach to the EU but on the chewing gum side we're going to have to realize the big risk of being so carbon intensive so the best thing we can do to protect our industry from these me mechanisms, whether they from the European Union or from wherever, wherever else they could arise, is to decarbonise our economy as fast as possible. And the good news on that front is that decarbonised electricity is definitely cheaper than carbon-based electricity. Uh, so that's, that's very powerful. The bad news is we're moving so slowly. We should have been moving much faster in terms of our rollout of wind, solar and storage and that just in our own self-interest, because it's one way to mitigate against uh, load shedding as fast as possible, to roll out those because they are the cheapest and the quickest to deploy, and they are effective in a system that, that you know that is energy short as we are at the moment. Having variable renewable energy at a scale is going to help, and uh, research coming out of Meridian Economics shows that five gigawatts of additional wind and solar variable renewable sources in a system that's energy short but has pump storage and things that can be used could have reduced our load shedding by up to 90 percent last year. So it makes sense on so many fronts but on this front this is the biggest defense that we have being proactive on rolling out wind and solar as fast as possible and decarbonizing our economy as fast as possible is going to give us natural defense and sustainable defence against these sort of protective measures that are, are being implemented in places like European Union for now, but definitely with others to come in future. Thank you. That's the second tag show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.